This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. I'm here in Beaverton, Oregon, just outside of Portland, checking out Rhino Motors and their very first microcycle. About six years ago, what, what happened was I got an email from some, this guy named Chris Hoffman, and he said, I need some help getting this balancing unicycle thing running. And I was in Bend, Oregon, which is like about a three-hour drive over the mountains, and I came here to Portland, and he showed me this thing in his garage. And this is what uh, started it, kicked it off. His daughter found a, a, a one-wheeled motorcycle in a video game and decided that what he would, she asked him, can you build one of these? And the first thing you do when, when people give you a wacky idea is you try and kill it with Google. So he, he Googled and couldn't find anything like what she was talking about. And she sketched out what she wanted and everything. She was a cool teenager. And uh, so he built this and couldn't get it to balance, and so he called me in because I had been doing some balancing stuff uh, and, and blogged it on my website. So we got this to balance and uh, thought it was really a, a cool thing until we found out that you really can't steer it with your upper body, which we thought you could use body English in order to get the thing steering. So then we went to prototype two, which is this over here. And this allows you to use your body uh, to steer by swinging the weight over the sides of the wheel. And uh, this, this helped us uh, develop a, a business plan, something we could show people and say, would you like to invest in? so that we could move to the next step, which was this product, the third prototype, which we thought would work well for the street, but turned out that people didn't like the radical design that we had. It was, it was a little bit too Italian superbike looking. So then we moved back uh, over to a different design that's similar to this, which I can't show you because we're in the middle of building it. <laughs> So anyway, the, uh, the upshot of that is we've got some, some other stuff we can show you, but I need to go in and make sure that the, the new bits are covered up. Okay, go ahead. This basically is, is uh, a lot of picks that are running at 30 MIPS that I'm using for redundancy, and this is like the dashboard LEDs. Nice. So that sort of thing, and, you know, just... Just you know, flash the uh, flash the chips and test and change the code, recompile. You know the loop, right? Oh yeah. You just have to kind of do and then, that over and over. And, and then have the bike fall over, and then gather the data and find out why. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's that's kind of how it works. And, so uh, why go with picks? Um, I'm using picks because they're they're reasonably cheap. They're inexpensive. I mean, they make them by the ton. And picks um, have a lot of features in them that that for an embedded system is is quite positive. I mean, like things like failover circuits for things like main clock and things like that, so that you don't have to worry about uh, the thing starting up and then the crystal oscillator failing, and then you have to what do you do next? Well, it fails over automatically to an, an RC oscillator, so that you, you you're always going. And, and in, in what you have to do always with embedded systems is have some way of flagging those failures. And, and in our product, for instance, if there is some sort of a failure, it just dials the speed down so it doesn't let you go faster than a brisk walk until you shut the machine off. And then if you turn it back on and the, fail, and the fault is still there, then you're not going anywhere. You're pushing it home, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So... We, we've tried through redundancy and through all of these other things to try and make a product that uh, is safe for people to use and, and uh, design the handling of it so that it's fun for people to use. So how many picks are in it? Lots of picks. Uh, I'd, I'd say at, at least four, maybe five. It just depends. <laughs> and so each has a different uh, subsystem that it monitors yeah, and there's, controls? There's, or how does yeah, there's one, for dis there's one for the display. Uh, there's ones for controlling the motors. There's ones for, for checking the balance, both in the pitch and the roll axis. So there's all sorts of things going on. And 
we use gyros and accelerometers in order to get that stable reference that you need in order to decide the guy's leaning forward, so move the motors forward, the guy's leaning back. So Is that something you have back. to calibrate every time? Uh, no, you don't really need to calibrate it. I mean, once it, because it's, it's dialed into where the center of the earth is, right, through the accelerometers, it's, it's not uh, uh, an excessive uh, calibration. This is what I was talking about, redundancy. We've got like 2,000 watt motors that we're using to, uh, to drive a big wheel that then drives uh, um, an automobile rim. And when you put it all together, it kind of looks like this. And so everything lives inside of the wheel? Everything lives inside of the wheel. The batteries, the electronics, the motors, everything. Except for that little display which sits on the handlebars and a few buttons. And so is everything electric? We started off with lead acid, but they're so heavy that it makes the wheel just really hard to maneuver. So lead, the lithium ions I think are maybe about a third of the weight, but they're yeah, at least three times the cost. And three times the complexity when it comes to charging and everything. Yeah, so the chargers are more expensive, the batteries are more expensive, and, and that's, that's a leading item for anything that uses a lot of power. I mean, if batteries were cheap, everybody would be driving a Tesla, right? Right. So that's well, kind of... The individual 18650 that they put in them is really cheap. It's just that you need 2,000 of them or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, and if you go over to uh, the Tesla store and ask them, it turns out that they don't just buy them from anybody. They buy special ones that, that are made by Panasonic. And so what do you guys use? Well, we're going through and evaluating a bunch of battery vendors right now, so I don't have a good answer. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> so is it classified as a motorcycle, or how does that work? It's technically going to be classified as a scooter, um, personal mobi mobility device. Uh, the top speed is 12 and a half miles an hour, so you can use it in all the different types of environments that you would not use a car. So, you know, sidewalk, bike lane, um, you know, getting around in that sort of capacity. And our goal is to have this as a product that, you know, both consumers will use. It'll be a lot of fun to get around, but um, there'll also be some other applications in terms of industrial, um, also in terms of, uh, you know, um, manufacturing, security, things along those lines as well. So there'll be multiple channels that we are, are looking to, to, to tap into. So what did I do? Oh, there's the key. So the idea is this one's got a big fan in it, so it makes vacuum cleaner noises. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to pick this up and lean it forward and you can see that the wheel moves forward and if I lean backwards so that's kind of the idea is when this leans forward the the motor moves a proportional amount to keep you in balance and essentially you know what uh, what Tony was just showing is it works just like that when you're riding it too you just you know, lean forward a little bit, and again, you just keep going forward. And then, um, same thing with slowing down and stopping, you lean back. Just lean forward and lean back. And then what you can do, and one of the things we're working on, is just setting the balance in a different place depending on, you know, your size and your weight. So, it's not exactly set up for me right now because I'd have to sort of, I'd, and I might probably need to do that, and we can do another, uh, another cut because I'm having to lean forward quite a bit to get it to go. Okay. Um, so, you do calibrate it to your weight. It's not necessarily to your weight. It has more to do with um, with your height and when, when, where your body mass is. Oh, where your center and is. Also where you, yeah, exactly. Because it always knows where the center of the earth is. And so that's where it needs to stay. So you've got to get your body weight over the front to be able to get it to go forward, right? So it just depends on where you are. And that'll be different whether I'm sitting on the front of the bike or whether I'm sitting on the back of the bike. So if I'm sitting on the back, it'll tend to go back. If I sit more towards the front, it'll be more on the front. So. You know, that's basically. And has a uh, has a braking working? So I see you've got a brake lever. What's well, that about? you know, it is a brake lever, and uh, right now, um, essentially, the we don't like to call it a brake because you're always engaged with the product, so you're never braking. You're actually we'd like to call it as the stop assist lever, 
So, you know, if you're leaning way forward, you're telling the bike to go forward, right? And if you pull the brake, then you're telling the bike to do two things at once, correct? Right. You're telling it both to go backwards because essentially all it does is it drives the motor a little bit harder to ride it back in front of you so that you can, it, it assists you to get your weight back to slow down. So it's not essentially a brake. Yes. So it's it kind just of tells it to transfer the power. It's transferring the power and it's a stop assist lever is what we're calling it. So is it because when you're in a full lean, you know, going top speed, that it's difficult to push yourself back on the handlebars to a position well, where your weight is in reverse? That's a good question. Uh, so it's interesting. It sort of finds its happy place, I guess is the best way to say it. So as you're leaning forward, you'll get up to a speed you're comfortable at, and then once you're there, if you find that neutral spot, it'll go. So it's actually not difficult to get your weight back once you're at that spot. But say, if for example, if you're trying to accelerate and you want to stop fast, that's when you want to start putting your weight back. It'll help you get there a little bit more quickly. But if you're at a constant speed and you're just neutral, you'll just cruise along and then you just lean back and you'll slow down fairly quickly. Does that yeah, yeah. make sense? Yeah. So and uh, and the turning mechanism, how does that feel? Like, is it is it... Do you ride motorcycles or bicycles? Is, does it feel natural like that? or? I do ride. I've, I've been riding motorcycles for about 20 years. I, I, I ride bikes as well. Um, and it is definitely a, a, a unique, different, really fun experience. Uh, it's, it's essentially in a straight line. It's very much like riding a bicycle. I mean, in the sense that, you know, you're just there, you're engaged with the handlebars. Um, turning's a little, bit, a little bit different, and that takes a little bit of practice because, you know, you only are, you're only on one wheel rather than two wheels. So when you're, when you're turning, it, I liken it to riding a bicycle when you're at a very, very slow speed or a motorcycle where you kind of need to keep your body weight over um, you know, the top of the bike. So it's more, there's a little bit more hips involved in terms of getting, keeping your body centered and actually turning at the same time. And again, it's one of those things that, that, that becomes second nature. It just takes a little bit of practice. So. Right. And so yeah. the handlebars are to what, help you, uh, assist you in shifting your weight? Um, Maybe something to work against or what? The, the handlebars is, is really is just an idea to, to bring this, to, to make it much and feel much more accessible. I mean, when you don't have anything at all in front of you, it feels it's a true unicycle without, you know, without anything in front of you. It, it's a pretty unnerving feeling and this actually settles people in and I think it makes uh, you know th th this sort of um, you know, a build a, a lot more accessible and, and, and easier for people to sort of wrap their minds around because I mean as it is you know people when we take this out I and mean, people are fascinated you know by you know the fact that how do you do that how could you possibly do that how could that thing work and um, but it does it's kind of a new category of a product I mean we we're referring to it as a and we talked about this a lot. What are we going to call this thing? I mean, it's not a bicycle, right? I mean, bicycle. I mean, and technically a unicycle is, I guess, but I think it's a little bit, doesn't it describe it as well because it has handlebars on it, which a unicycle doesn't. And uh, it's not really a scooter. It's not a motorcycle. So we actually coined the phrase microcycle. And, uh, and that's kind of what we're, we're, what we're referring to it as. Would, would you say that the technology, it's not inconceivable that one day that something like this could be on the road? I would say that at this point in this world that, that nothing is inconceivable. I mean, who, who at this point in, in the environment that we live in and the technology and as fast as it's moving would, would, would put a limit on anything? I'm, sure. Yeah. Would you ride one on the road? Would I, oh, I'd, I'd ride this one on the road. I have ridden on the road. Uh, you know, would I, would I go 60? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I sure they said my, the first... I'm in sure my they 20s, said, I might yeah. have. <laughs> I'm sure they said the same thing the first time a motorcycle went 60 miles an hour. Yeah. And, you know, that's also, that's today. You know, in, in 10 years, you know, I might say, absolutely, yeah. I, you know, I, I would, I'll definitely go 60 on this thing. Sure, just get an, give it an ejection seat and a parachute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, all it needs is some rockets. Call yeah. it a day. Yeah. Here we go. You gonna take it for a spin? <laughs> yeah. I haven't ridden that one. It's a little short. Have you ridden the other one? Yeah. Oh, you have? Yeah, I've ridden the other one, but they can put the seat down on the other one. Oh, yeah. gotcha. There we go. 
go. Now I'm starting to get the feel for this one again. I was used to riding the other one, so. Cool. All right, is that enough? Can you like spin in place, or what, what kind of turning radius do you get? Well, I mean, you can turn from probably in a three foot radius, but that's the other thing, cool thing about it in terms of, you know, being in an environment like um, a sidewalk or a busy mall or wherever it is you might want to get around is, you know, your entire footprint isn't much larger than if you were just standing. So in terms of getting on a train or maneuvering around people, and then if you just want to turn around or move around, it's the same thing, you know, you can pretty much, you can pivot on a dime, right? So you don't, you don't have to take up any space at all. And then you can probably turn between anywhere from a, a three foot radius to a, you know, 20, 30, 40, however long and wide a sweep that you want to take, so. Yeah. And so do you have uh, an idea for like kickstands or some sort of way to, because now that the power is cut, it's not balancing itself. That's exactly right, yeah. There's no balancing. You can roll it back and forth, but you have to balance it yourself, and there you go. She's parked. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, it's a little tricky. The, 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 that's a, a, a kickstand for a one-wheeled product because you've got to have three purchase points. There's only one with a bicycle or a motorcycle or anything else. You've always got your three purchase points. So mm -hmm. we'd have to create three purchase points with this, which is why the front um, parking bars uh, make the most sense at this point. And we're working on, you know, again, this is one of the other things we're, we're working on. But, again, to have this thing be stable and be able to just have a kickstand, it would have to be a special customized kickstand. So, um, yeah, for now, this is how, we're, uh, how she parks. That's really cool. I want to take a quick moment to thank our awesome sponsor Domain.com and let you guys know about one of my favorite top level domains. That's right, it's the .NET. This thing is globally known, it's one of the most popular domain names and it instantly injects credibility into whatever your project may be. So if you already have a .com, you might want to consider protecting your brand with getting that .NET to go with. I know we did with Hack Across America and Darren Kitchen as well. You, in fact, if you don't want to register an insanely long .com, the .NET is a great alternative alternative and at just $8.99 a year at domain.com it's totally the way to go in fact we've got the hookup for you because they're a huge fan of hack5 and you guys so the guys over at domain.com they want to hook everybody up with 15% off their already affordable domain names and web hosting all you have to do is use the coupon code HAK5 at domain.com's checkout that's 15% off and big savings so don't forget to use the coupon code hack5 when you think domain names think domain.com Last week's trivia question was, who originally wrote the code for an egg drop and when did he write that code? Now the answer was Robbie Pointer in December of 1993. This week's question is, as of April 2012, what 3D printer was the most funded technology product on Kickstarter? You can answer that over at hack5.org trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 goodies.